can the wealthy save the rest of us from themselves? This week, venture capitalist and wealthy person Nick Hanauer tells us what's wrong with rich people. And Raphael Chap describes her scheme to even the playing field with a Robin Hood hedge fund. Welcome to the Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. All right, folks, are you ready? We are actually allowing an investor and entrepreneur to our cameras. Nick Hanauer is actually a lot more than simply a venture capitalist and an entrepreneur. He is somebody who is raising alarm bells everywhere from TED to Davos about the perils of inequality, not to your conscience, although that too, but to your pocketbook and to the sustainability of our world as we know it. Nick Hanna, welcome to the program. Glad Thank to you. have you. Thank you. We have a lot of grassroots <laughs> activists and people who are against people like you, so I, I want to give you a chance to talk. Um, Defend myself. No, no. <laughs> Introduce yourself, let's put it that way. Give us a bit of background. Where'd you come from? Uh, um, well, I, I live in Seattle, and I grew up in a family business, and uh, a, a, bed pillow and man, a bed pillow and down comforter manufacturing business, and grew up in that business, still uh, own and help manage that business, but started starting other companies when I was very young, and I'm now a Basically, I'm a technology entrepreneur and venture capitalist. Um, and you and were very genius lucky. to invest in a company yeah, that was maybe at some very people lucky off called have Amazon. A, yeah, I was very, very early interest in the internet. And as luck would have it, I uh, had a friend who had an early interest in the internet. His name was Jeff Bezos. And so, um, and so I became the first non-family investor in that. And from that experience, made a lot of money, obviously. And from that experience, started starting other internet companies, including a company called Aquantive, which was an internet advertising company. Uh, that you may not have heard of, but we sold to Microsoft in 2007 for six and a half billion dollars, but dozens of others. I mean, I think I've helped with 35 companies. So fair like to that. say you have a lot of money. I do. You could be off, I don't know, vacationing in the Bahamas. Yeah, um, I do that sometimes. But you don't only do that. No. You also have an organization called Civic Ventures. Yes. Tell us a bit about the campaign that you've uh, gotten involved in over the last few years. Well, I mean, Civic Ventures is the, my political organization, and we try, uh, you know, our slogan is disruptive innovation in the civic sphere. So I, so my business has been disruptive innovation, technology, entrepreneurship, and, uh, and investment. And um, the same tools and strategies that you use to disrupt an existing industry work in the civic space. How so? Um, well, I mean, if you're clever, you can turn things upside down. And, um, you know, so uh, what's important, I think, to recognize is that human prosperity is linked to innovation, right? Innovation is how we solve problems and improve living standards. But innovation always creates disruption because it creates change. So in a healthy society, the rate of civic innovation must match the rate of technological innovation. And how are we doing? It, well. Uh, in Seattle, Washington, we're doing pretty well. Around the country, uh, we're not. And a lot of the problems that the society faces are, 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 can be thought of as the gap between technological innovation, mm -hmm. disruption, and change, so, and the pace at which we're adjusting to it. So give us an example. Um, well, I mean, the, the, you know, the minimum wage. So if the minimum wage uh, had tracked inflation, it would be 10 bucks. If it had tracked productivity gains, it would be $20. And what happened to the economy, for good and bad reasons, is that it became a service that it became a service economy. It was a manufacturing economy with high wage jobs. It became a service economy with low wage jobs. And what's important for people to recognize is a barista at Starbucks who gets paid eight dollars an hour isn't less well trained than an auto worker in prior years, doesn't create less value than an auto worker does. They're simply paid less because they have less bargaining uh, power. And that's a consequence of the changes in the economy. And so we have to make adjustments for that to sustain the economy because if people don't have any money, then who will mm -hmm. capitalists like me sell to, right? So the implications of that are enormous, and not just with respect to minimum wages. I mean, the transformation yeah. of the economy that you're talking about, yes. what else does it affect? Well, I mean, you know, the best way to understand what's happened is that corporate profits as a percent of GDP 30, 40 years ago were about 6% of GDP. Today, they're 12 to 13 percent of GDP. GDP is, one, is 17 trillion dollars. So that's a trillion extra dollars mm. 
in corporate profits. Wages used to be 52% of GDP, now they're 46. So six, so a trillion dollars that used to be profits, or, uh, I'm sorry, used to be wages are now profits. And that trillion dollars isn't profit because it needs to be or should be or has to be. It's profits because powerful people like me prefer it to be. <laughs> but profits used to be thought of as what you needed to gather yes. together so that people could make jobs, yes. start new businesses, hire more people, buy more widgets, And now buy they're more the machines. point of the corporation rather than an output of the corporation. And that shareholder capitalism ethic and the legal constructs that, ha that have buttressed that over time are super pernicious and are part of what's killing the economy, killing the middle class, and killing our democracy. And all of that has to shift, and pe but people have to recognize what's happened and start to fight against so it. So how do you shift it in the civic, in the political sphere, in the sense that we're in an election year where you have that typical fight um, between people who talk about fairness, people who talk about growth. And yeah. the growth folks, particularly on the Republican side, said well, the way you get growth is you allow profits to congregate, yes. you, you don't restrict business, you deregulate industry. Yes. That's how we have a future. That's right. And, and those economic ideas, the neoclassical economic idea and the trickle-down economics policy framework that people derive from that turn out to be totally and completely wrong. Tax cuts don't lead to growth. Investments in the middle class do. So, so growth in a technological capitalist economy are the, con are the consequence, is the consequence rather, of and of a feedback loop between increasing amounts of innovation and increasing amounts of demand, which means that um, the, the more people you include more robustly as consumers, workers, entrepreneurs, inventors in the economy, the better it goes. Mm -hmm. And what that means is a thriving middle class is the source of growth in a technological capitalist economy, not an effect of it, not a consequence of it. Which means that raising the minimum wage isn't bad for capitalism, even though it may inconvenience a few capitalists in mm -hmm. particular, it's indispensable to capitalism. A thriving middle class is the source of growth in a technological capitalist economy, not a consequence of it. And once you see it that way, now you realize that a lot of our policies are upside down, right? I mean, the most pernicious thing about trickle-down economics is not the belief that if the rich get richer, that will be good for the economy. The most pernicious thing is believing, as so many people do, that if the poor get richer, that will be bad for the economy, which is literally what the Republicans are claiming, mm -hmm. that we should eliminate the minimum wage and somehow this will be good for everybody. <laughs> it's like, it is, you know, the claim that if wages grow, employment will shrink is as idiotic as claiming that if plants grow, animals will shrink. I mean, it's ludicrous. Of course, that's not how the world works. And yet, those ideas have been accepted by politicians and, and you know, a lot of neoclassical economists. So let's talk about another aspect of change that you've alluded to when you say that, you know, for the good of the whole, a few individuals might need to, might need to take a hit right now. Our economy is also very based on the idea that the individual is the engine of ingenuity, innovation, et cetera. And yet you're suggesting we need to think about well, it's about shifting from a we voice to a, I mean, a me voice to a we voice. Yeah. How do we do that? No, I mean, I, I think both things can be true. So on the one hand, um, we need people to be super inventive, super aggressive, super risk-taking, all that stuff. I mean, innovation really is the source of how we solve problems and increase living standards. But in the absence of demand, there is no innovation, right? You can't you know, the, it's the sound of one hand clapping. If you have no, no one to make things for, then you, you actually don't have innovation, which is, why, um, which is why wages are so essential to innovators. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the truth is that if in the near term, some giant corporations make a little bit less at percentage of profits, over the long term, in aggregate, we'll all make more money, including them, as the size of the economy increases, right? It, it, look, it, if low wages equaled prosperity, then the lowest wage places on Earth would be the most prosperous, but they're not. The highest wage places are. Why? Because that's the target rich opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, Apple Computer was started here because here is where the most people are to sell to, mm -hmm. right? That's how you can build the scale to build these products. And what right? about your take on the market and how it functions? Is it magic? Does it work efficiently? 
So market, market economies aren't efficient at all. That's, that's a misnomer. M market, m a market is an evolutionary system, and there's nothing efficient about evolution, but what it is is super effective. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what nature is. It's an, it's an effective way to solve problems. And a dynamic market economy is mostly an economy of failure with these amazing things that pop out, work, and multiply, right? Apple Computer is an example of a thing that succeeded and, and, and flourished. That diversity doesn't hinder growth, it supercharges mm -hmm. it because the more people who approach pro uh, problems differently, simultaneously, the faster it is that you get on top of those problems. And, and so the promise of market uh, economies, if they're well managed, if we deliberately and purposefully include people with wages, education, infrastructure, uh, it provides opportunity for everybody to live up to their potential. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll have some inequality in something like that, but not radical and raging inequality. So what, what, what <coughs> place is there in all of that for, for planning? What do you see as So I don't think that there's any place in a, in a market economy for planning, but I do think there's a place in it for goals. So for instance, you can say to your, so it probably makes no sense to say our plan is to make that company uh, or that industry the answer to the alternative energy challenge mm -hmm. that we face. But it makes a huge amount of sense to say we have to find a way to transition from oil to alternatives. Mm -hmm. Here's a zillion dollars in incentives for every kind of alternative idea we can find to explore the possibilities and see what works. So you don't want to cho you don't want to choose winners, but you have to choose games. That strategy. You've painted in some of your speeches a fairly bleak scenario of what might happen if, if things, the, yeah. we continue on the current course. Yes. Do you still feel that bleak? And what's that scenario? The thing about revolutions is that they come slowly and then suddenly, right? And so in 1980, the, the top 1% of Americans shared about 8% of in income, and the bottom 50% of Americans shared about 18% of income. Today, the top 1% of Americans share about 22, 23, 24% of income. The bottom 50% of Americans now share about 12 or 11. So 300% increase, 50% decrease. Um, uh, at current course and speed, if you simply just assume that it will continue on, in, 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 on that path in another 30 years, uh, the top 1% of Americans will share about 35, 40% of income and the bottom about five or six. And it is impossible, it, I think it's just unrealistic to expect that that will unfold and not result in riots and revolution. I, I, just, I, I just don't think the 95% of Americans who will be savaged by that trend are going to be like, oh, it's fine, don't worry about it. I think, they'll, I think they will go crazy. And look, the Republican primary is a sign of how crazy people are already becoming. And uh, I think that that eventuality will be horrible for everybody, but particularly for people like me, <laughs> because people are going to be angry and they're going to look to blame people, and that is just something that we want to avoid. Nick, thank you so much. Great to Super have you. Super nice to really be here. Thank you. Talk with you. Let us imagine. What do we actually want our world to become? Not as it presently is and is becoming with finance and blockchain. Not as financial technologies are presently used, but how we wish them to be used. Let's imagine that the year is now 2020. Capital is distributed and a P2P relation. That there are no banks, at least not as they exist today and that finance has increasingly become free of its current misuses. That's a glimpse of a video made by Robin Hood Media about a project in the financial world that's being called Another Way to Occupy Wall Street. It's an activist hedge fund, if you like, using financial technology to democratize finance. 
Raphael Chap, a former VP of tax law at Goldman Sachs, is now the co-founder of a suite of investment tools under this Robin Hood banner. Could finance capital really be used to, de to redistribute power and resources and not just to amass private wealth? Perhaps. Raphael, tell us a little bit about what we just saw. There's a London office of, of this Robin Hood operation. What right. are you looking at? We have an algorithm, we call it the parasite, and what it does is it replicates the investments of what we consider to be insiders on Wall Street. Um, so we, we form a portfolio that replicates those investments, and so far we've gotten great returns. I think last year was 40% return, which made it the second hedge fund in the world. Uh, but of course, you know, it's a little bit of um, impertinence. We're trying to hack it, derail it. Um, so deprivatize de all that private information sure, about the market. Sure, and I think that it's just a very small dent. You know, if you think about all the types of strategies out there that hedge funds are using to make investments, we're we're just we're basically mim mimicking a very small segment. There are things that we could not track or trace. Um, uh, high frequency trading, for example, you have hundreds of trades happening yeah. every minute. We wouldn't be able to do that, but we do our best to hack it with the tools we have. Are there things you wouldn't invest in that they're investing in? Um, well, uh, they're taking a very um, ethically blind approach. Um, if a company that manufactures weapons is a good investment, we invest in it. Um, I might have my own reservations, but other than that, sure. So yeah. replicate the budget, uh, replicate mm -hmm. the pattern, the investments, the investments generate some profits and returns right. for your members, but then do some different things with them. Um, well, what we do is we reinvest a portion of those profits, and we actually um, use that to f to fund people's art art projects. People who would no not normally have access to finance to 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 get funded for their products. So that's that's a separate side of Robin Hood. You are putting more money into some industries. We talked about armaments. Yes. We don't want more money in. Sure, and that's that's what's driving our efforts to actually move into Robinhood 2.0, uh, Robinhood Financial Services, where we try to take the positions that, hey, we need alternative financial assets. Um, so we need to have individuals, small businesses, startups, need to be able to issue their own securities um, and we, that's something we would want to invest in. But right now, we're still trying to create those markets. So we're trying to create a platform where people could go on, engineer their own capital structure, issue securities, and we would try to connect those people with investors. Um, of course, we have to work around issues of transparency, how to build trust. But essentially, we want to empower alternative financial markets uh, to help the general public, both on the investor side and on, on the issuer side, to use those tools to create um, an alternative parallel e economy. Mm. And how did you get involved in this? I mean, you were in the heart of finance capital at Goldman Was. Sachs, removed from everything looking like the commons and removed from most regular people. Your clients were presumably fairly major investors. Uh, yes, I was. I was working at Goldman Sachs, and I was structuring their tax uh, financial strategy. Uh, Avoidance uh, strategy. Uh, <laughs> <Just> <laughs> I kidding. didn't say it. <laughs> uh, tax minimization. There you go. Um, but I got appetite for, I wanted to understand about finance in the broader sense. Um, so I got curious about economics and finance. I was originally a tax attorney. I decided to pursue a PhD in economics. Um, I started in 2008, which was just as Perfect. the world was collapsing, so I, I got a little bit of uh, interesting timing there. Um, yes, I mean, it's been uh, an interesting trajectory. I think most people who are in this world maybe stay there, but I was more driven by intellectual curiosity and sort of gro intellectual growth, so I felt I had capped a little bit. And, wanted to pursue other interests. So that's how I ended up um, doing my PhD. Right now I'm working on the link between finance and wealth inequality. I'm trying to understand if financial markets work for the same for everyone or if some people get better returns because they have um, uh, advantages that regular investors don't. Finally, are we talking about a future then without investment banks? Potentially, um, or a future where instead of having just a few major investment banks, uh, you might have a more decentralized network 
of um, underwriters, um, because there's still a role to play for investment banks, the issue of uh, uh, building trust, you know, due diligence, uh, reducing the risk of frauds. So You, you know, may have a greater confidence in, <laughs> than I do that they do any of those things. <laughs> but I think what I'm hearing is we could see a future with more financial institutions that instead of being too big, perhaps are too small to fail, mm -hmm. too well connected, too embedded in communities. Right, right. Um, it's an interesting point. You know, the technology is there now that, that financial assets could be traded and they could be traded on uh, um, open source platforms. So potentially we no longer need a stock market or um, a clearing house of some sort, but there are still issues, sure. of course, having to do with concentration of these new markets. You know, at the beginning, the internet was very decentralized and now it's very concentrated. So this is the same thing might happen. Mm. So um, the potential for more democracy is there, but that doesn't mean that there aren't hurdles or barriers. So yeah. speak to somebody out there. You're a former Goldman Sachs VP. This is bread and butter to you. You understand this stuff. Talk to somebody out there before we close who maybe is feeling completely intimidated and lost at this point. Why is this area of finance um, something to get mm. involved in? Well, look, you have savings. What do you do with them? You can put them in the bank. Savings accounts, are, the rates are very low. Pathetic. You can put it in the stock market, uh, but maybe the risk return profile is actually not that attractive. Um, S&P 500, the performance for a diversified portfolio has not been that great. So, you know, maybe um, you can actually get higher returns by investing in your peers in small businesses um, and maybe in startups, even though startups do have a higher level of risk, but maybe overall you have a better risk return profile and you arguably could have um, a more empowering relationship to finance rather than view it as um, something that yeah. is scary. You know, you might, you might have um, a more of an ability to have a say um, in, in what these, in, in the governance of these, of these entities. I'm certainly hearing, don't leave it to those guys on Wall Street to figure out what to do with our great big assets. Raphael, thank you so much. It's You're fascinating very welcome. talking to you. I, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. You can find out more at our website. Enough time has gone by that it's worth following up on a question that was raised and then rapidly dropped this spring. Remember the Panama Papers, that staggering dump of 11.5 million documents on 14,000 clients of the law firm Mossack Fonseca in Panama? Mossack Fonseca offered legal assistance to people and businesses seeking to set up shop in tax havens around the world. Well, a couple of hundred U.S. addresses showed up in the Panama Papers. Not all belonged to American citizens, but some did. The Obama-connected Pritzker family name appeared, as did others like John Michael Krim, a convicted tax evader, and Democratic donor slash movie mogul David Geffen. Still, no big American banks, no huge American firms, as a result, no crowds massed demanding resignations, and unlike in Iceland, no political heads rolled, but maybe they should have. Why so few Americans? Well, part of the explanation is probably media bias. You should never discount the deference in our media for those with money and influence, or the disdain they have for reporting that's done mostly elsewhere. But the most important part of the answer is Americans don't need Fonseca. Plenty of U.S. law firms manage offshore assets right here. They don't need to go to Panama because they can find those firms in the U.S. There's nothing illegal, after all, about setting up an offshore trust. What's illegal is hiding your assets to avoid paying debts or tax. The U.S. is a world-class tax haven nation. Because American laws on corporate structures are so flexible, the tax breaks we offer corporations are so big, and the tax we charge on capital gains is so extra especially low. The fact is, it is harder to find a more attractive place to make a lot of money than right here. And states like Nevada and Delaware offer virtual anonymity for corporate clients. Who needs Panama when we have the home state of Joe Biden? Come to think of it, maybe that's why we've heard the White House say so little about Fonseca. Scandal? What scandal? Finding legal ways to dodge your debts to the nation is the good old American way of doing business. And tell me what you think. Write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A at lauraflanders.com.
Is this week on the Laura Flanders Show, making sense of the election season with a historian. Eric Foner is my guest. The face of racism today is not uh, a Klansman, really. It's not Bull Connor with his dogs. It's a banker in a three-piece suit. And I'll be talking a little about a hundred-year-old proclamation that's worth taking a new look at. That's all coming up right here on the Laura Flanders Show. I am Laura Flanders. This week on the show, the incomplete, true, authentic, and wonderful history of May Day. The time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you throttle today. And later in the program, Avi Lewis. So this movement is alive and well in Argentina, but more importantly, it's been spreading globally. 